Welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I will be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open their studios to the public. For more information, you can go to the website svos.org. Our guest, Debbie Backer, is an award-winning Bay Area artist who works both in pen and ink as an illustrator and also as a watercolorist. Her passion for detail inspires all of her artwork, and she's here to demonstrate how she creates her very intricate and beautiful art. So welcome, Debbie. Thanks, Sally. It's great to be here. So you have such vibrant colors in your watercolor paintings and such very beautiful details. Thanks. How did you get involved in creating such art? Well, I've always been a creative person. I studied uni at university originally for instrumental music, and I've sewed costumes for community theater and taught dramatic storytelling. But it wasn't until 2006 that I actually um, tried my hand at drawing and painting. Wow, only 2006. So 2006. all of this beautiful work you started learning in 2006. It is. I met an illustrator in 2006 in Missouri, a wonderful artist named John Steckley. And he did these amazingly detailed and intricate pen and ink sketches with watercolor of historical buildings. Oh, beautiful. And I absolutely fell in love with illustration. And um, I took my first drawing class because of uh, meeting this artist and ended up going to the Academy of Art University in San Francisco and got my BFA in illustration, specializing in children's book illustration originally. So your, your first foray was in illustration? Yes. Detail. So tell us a little bit about what an illustration starts as. What tools do you use? How do you go about planning an illustration? Well, illustrations uh, have a, come a, lo a lot out of your imagination. Right. And it's very hard to take animals and objects uh, doing things that they don't normally do or things that you don't normally see out of your imagination. Right. So the first thing I do is I use a lot of tracing paper. And I put all different pieces of um, the illustration together, kind of like a puzzle, and on different pieces of tracing paper. And I move them around and I redraw them until I really feel like they fit together. That's interesting. So you have like a p patchwork of It is. And then I tape it down onto my uh, light box. Okay, so the light's shining through. The light's shining through. And I put on top of that a sheet of 140 pound bright white watercolor paper, hot press. Okay. I like, uh, for my illustrations, I use a hot press so that it can take pen and ink very smoothly. Okay. Uh, so yeah. I don't want a rough texture. No, it's very smooth. And I use um, a technical pen um, this is uh, the Rapidograph Technical Pen mm -hmm. by Kolinor. And the technical pens aren't quite as expressive as some of the other pens, but they keep a really nice tight line. Right. And they, uh, one of the most important things about it is they have a cartridge that you fill with India ink. Aha. Uh -huh. And I use a very waterproof India ink. I use the Kolinor ink. And it needs to be waterproof uh, because once I've done my sketch on the watercolor paper, I then take my ink sketch and I throw it in the bathtub. So you put the paper on the light box and you can see the tracing paper. I can see going my image it. right oh. through. And then you draw directly with pen, not pencil? Not pencil. Oh. And the reason why is my illustrations. Um, are for reproduction, right. and I don't like to get a lot of graphite on my page yeah, and a lot of eraser marks. It. That's right. And so I work directly with the pen and ink, and it keeps the images just a little more fresh if you haven't tightened up by drawing and redrawing it uh, with the pencil first and then right. the ink. 
And then when it's done, you throw it in the bathtub? I throw it in the bathtub. Uh, it was a scary process to figure out in the first place. Why? Uh, but because then I need to stretch. 140-pound uh, watercolor paper uh, does better. It doesn't buckle as oh. much when you're painting on it if you stretch it. But if I stretch it first, then I can't put it on my light box and work directly on it. Hmm, so I have to stretch it after the ink is done. So you throw it in the bathtub. I throw it in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> well, you brought some images of some of your illustrations. Let's I take did. a look at those now and see some of the work that you do. I started off at the Academy of Art specializing in children's book illustration. And um, the first kinds of paintings that I did at the Academy were uh, called narrative paintings. They had to tell a story. Children's book illustration in particular um, has a lot of other criteria that you have to work towards as well because it has to fit uh, the dimensions of the page for the book. Uh, it has to be artwork that can handle a fold in the middle um, and uh, some other things like that. You've got to plan where the text is going to go and you have to have great character development for children's books. That's just beautiful. Look at I the use, detail. Of thanks. That. A little mouse. It is a mouse. It's very cute. Um, I um, use pen and ink with my illustrations because it gives it a bolder, more graphic look, um, and that uh, seems to work well with illustration. This is different. This is very <laughs> different. Uh, this is one of my favorite characters. Um, it has a lot of pen and ink work to uh, develop the zebra. And this is a great example of uh, why I need to do a lot of versions on tracing paper first. Um, there weren't too many places you can go to uh, photograph zebras standing at bars <laughs> <laughs> no. um, to get your photo references. So it took a lot of work to figure out how I wanted the anatomy to work, where the gun belt will sit, things like that. That's beautiful. And how did you get the color? What did you use for color? Uh, the color is all done with watercolor. Oh, wow. Um, so the, the black and the the black is the ink with the colander pen, and then the watercolor wash is done after I've stretched the watercolor paper. Uh, this is a partner to my zebra. I met a woman uh, in a coffee shop once when I was hanging the um, zebra, and she asked me uh, where the wildebeest was. And it turns out that zebras and wildebeest have a symbiotic relationship and when you see zebras, you almost always see a wildebeest nearby. So that's you mean where in this Africa? idea in Africa. Oh, okay. Yes, not <laughs> not in the bar. Not in the bar. Well, in this bar, yes. I guess now. So is that all part of one illustration, the zebra and the wildebeest, or are they separate? It's not. It's two separate illustrations, and I actually have some designs for expanding the bar. It's a very successful bar so far, so <laughs> uh, we have some other unruly characters that are going to come and join them at the bar. This is um, a different kind of illustration. This isn't narrative illustration. This is called decorative illustration. And decorative illustration doesn't tell a story. It's just for entertainment and the fun of it and to enjoy the image on it. Um, my dinosaur series um, has a lot of uh, watercolor um, that I used both rock salt and table salt to try to create the textures in the reptile skin. So you put that on when it's wet? Yes, and you have to leave the salt there until it's very, very dry um, in order for the texture to really show up. So the greens of the skin there, is that where you did that? Exactly. Very nice. Um, so, still along the same line, I, um, because I'm doing these images for kids, not every kid, although most kids I know, uh, are dinosaur fans at some point in their life, um, but I decided to expand my collection of decorative illustration for children with some other characters, and this is one of them. You can see where my first uh, career as an elementary school teacher collides with my love oh, of yes. detail by adding all these other friends and 
things for kids to count so and talk about. Are the little fish around the edges or the dinosaurs around, are those also start with pen and then go to watercolor? They look... Yes, they wow. all are done in pen and ink first and then a watercolor wash how, afterwards. How big is that piece in real life? These pieces aren't that large. Um, the uh, dinosaurs and my undersea creatures are about 12 inches square. My zebra and cowboy are about uh, twice as big as that. And the shark. And my shark. Uh, something a little ferocious for uh, some kids and some of them are a little sweeter for other kids. Um, so it's something for everyone. So you went from illustration to fine art, watercolors as well. So let's yes. take a look at some of how you create a watercolor painting. Thanks. Um, I have taken some classes in Photoshop and that's been very, very helpful for me. The first thing I do after I've taken all my photos is I drop them into Photoshop so that I can look at the composition that I want and choose the dimensions and the size and I can experiment in Photoshop. Uh, Mother Nature has this way of laughing at you by putting <laughs> the perfect blossom in one photo and the perfect background right. in another. Uh, so sometimes I clip images from one photo and mm -hmm. bring them into my composition. And it's very important that you understand light source if you're going to yes. try to combine different photos. Now, once I have the composition I want, um, I blow it up to the size that I'm going to paint it. Um, and at this point, a lot of watercolor painters will put a sheet of graphite paper underneath it to transfer it, mm -hmm. but I use a slightly different process. Um, Why do you use black and white? Um, at this point, I don't need the color because I'm not using this as a color reference. I'm using this as a drawing reference. Mm -hmm. um, so the. The next thing I do is I use a tool in Photoshop called Find Edges. Oh, nice. Yeah. And it gets rid of all that value detail and it pops all the edges for me. Um, but you can see this is still very complicated. There's yes. a lot of little details. And I love those little details. <laughs> yes, you um, do. So the, what I do at this point is I, again in Photoshop, I uh, flip the image over so it's a reverse image of what I actually want to paint. Ah. Um, and the next thing I do, again, here's my tracing paper back again, just like my right. illustrations. And I actually put the tracing paper on top of the find edges image. Yes. And I draw it so that I really, really understand all the different uh, pieces uh, that make this uh, plant uh, accurate. Um, the other reason I do this is as I see my illustration uh, coming to life, mm -hmm. and it's easier for me to think of it as, a, um, as an illustration and a composition in the pencil sketch right. than it is as a photo. Yeah. Um, I, sometimes I realize there are some uh, elements that are possibly too close to the corner or not quite in the sweet spot that I want it to be right. in. Um, and so I can actually, I can still modify my illustration at this point. Is this how you do the illustrations that you showed and us before with this kind of That's exactly paper? what I do and uh -huh. I move all those little pieces around until they're exactly where I want them. Very nice, and then the next step is? The next step is transferring that image onto my watercolor paper. Now, this is um, an example of my pencil sketch. Uh, this is the side I worked on, and I have my pencil right. sketch. And now I flip it over. So it is now uh, right no side. longer a reverse image. It's the right way. So tell us a little bit about the watercolor paper that you use. Absolutely. So. I use a different watercolor paper for my fine art than I do for my illustrations. So this is rougher and it has an interesting edge. It is. This is a one. This is a 300 pound natural um, cold press. Right. So it's much thicker and uh, for me easier to work on. Right. And you don't have to see through it. 
Like and you it. don't, I don't have to see through <laughs> right. it because I'm using a, the yeah. different transfer method. Um, the other thing that I really love about the 300 pound paper is the beautiful deckled edge on um, right. the paper. So this rough, sort of torn looking. It is, and if you can see some of my um, fine art in the in the background, um, I like to show off that pretty deckled edge on the watercolor paper when I frame my artwork. So how do you get the edge like that? The sheets of watercolor paper come with the deckled edge already on the edge. Mm -hmm. But in this case, this is a half sheet right. is the size. So what I use is what's called a deckled edge ripper. Oh. And it's a ruler that you can place on your watercolor paper and then tear away the extra watercolor paper and it gives you that deckled edge on the ah. uh, on the uh, new, new cut new cut sides and then you transfer so how do you get this onto the paper so the, the graphite the pencil is on the back now right and I like to do this because you get very little graphite on you get no smudging right. and nice clean lines and to get this kind of detail you night you need those nice clean lines on your watercolor paper. And then I just take a ballpoint pen and I just simply rub all of the uh, pencil lines and it transfers it onto the watercolor paper. And Very nice. But I'm still not ready to start painting. Nope, okay. The next step. The next, this is interesting. Yeah, the next step is uh, masking fluid. Now, this is used to protect the areas that I want to keep white when I start painting. I've always wondered how watercolors do that. <laughs> well, it seems impossible. In, in this case, it is, and I'll show you why I use it at this stage. Most of the time, I do not use uh, any masking fluids while I'm actually painting the flower images themselves. Um, I like to just work around the white space. But at this point, I need to save it. I'm actually using a colored masking fluid at this stage. And I'm using uh, one that's called PBO's Drawing Gum, uh, which is the same as uh, any other masking fluid. But it comes in all sorts of colors. And by using a colored fluid, I can get very, very accurate edges. And I can really see what I'm saving. So you paint it on? I paint it on, mm -hmm. yes, with a paintbrush. And then what is this on the edge? This isn't Yeah, you fluid. know, the, I used to put the masking fluid all the way to the edge, but this deckled edge is actually quite delicate. Uh -huh. And sometimes it would tear. When I try to remove oh. the masking mm -hmm. fluid, I tear the deckled edge. So now I actually cut a little piece of artist tape on the edge and I bring my masking fluid all the way up onto the tape. Oh, very smart. Now, the, um, when I'm ready to remove the masking fluid, there's actually a special tool to remove it. And uh, it kind of looks like a uh, rubber eraser. Mm -hmm. And all you need to do is you take it and you very briskly rub the masking fluid and it comes right off and it doesn't damage your painting at all. Now let's see your color. Okay. So this is the first layer of paint that I put on it. And here I've already removed the masking right. fluid, so you can see why it was so important right. for me to save those whites. I'd never be able to get these really nice fluid lines painted if I had to stop and paint around all those tiny right. details. So what is the purpose of this layer? Um, there's a couple things that this underpainting achieves. The first thing that it does is it creates beautiful flowing shadows across the uh, painting and across the plants. One of the uh, challenges with painting so detailed is that it can end up almost like a paint by number painting, kind of mm -hmm. like cookie cutters where everything has its own color. And by painting, uh, this underneath, it connects the foreground and the background together, and mm -hmm. it also creates much more sophisticated local color, because no matter what you put on top, you'll get some areas that are more vibrant, some that are warmer, and mm -hmm. some that are cooler. Very nice. So the next layer of paint are my shadows. 
And I'm always thinking about uh, three watercolor techniques, uh, mix, mingle, and glaze. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a layer that's glazed on top of another, the first dry layer. Right. Uh, but my shadows are actually mingled colors. I make two little containers of uh, uh, cobalt blue and a mineral violet, mm -hmm. and I have them each in separate containers on my palette. And then I start painting my shadows with uh, the violet, and when my paintbrush runs out of violet, I just dip it into the blue and I mm -hmm. keep going. And it creates much more natural shadows because it has right. a natural variation in the color. Very nice. And so this piece is almost done, looks like. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. It has a lot more to go. But it's, it is about half done. You can see one of the things um, that I did to start with, so I really understand where I'm going, is I put a first layer of color on all my objects. Okay. And then I start building up the local color, which is the real color of the mm -hmm. objects, on top of those first two layers of color. Beautiful. So you're going to show us a little bit of how you would do that. I am going to show you that. So I have, um, I have three flowers on here. Uh, the first one you can see only has the underneath layers of paint. And uh, this flower has the beginning of the local color on it. Um, but this flower is much more realistic looking. And one of the reasons why is because of all the beautiful little details that happen on the edge of the painting, uh, uh, on the petals themselves. Yes. So what I, I always have a photo that I work from, but I also make sure that I have a uh, photo, the same photo, I put it on my iPad. And Beautiful. There are, there's two reasons I put it on my iPad. First, I put it on as two different photos, a, a darker version and a lighter version. And sometimes you can see the tiny details better and you go, oh, that's a leaf, that's not a stem, or that's a, a dark petal in the background. And I find that helpful. The other thing I do with my iPad is I can I zoom in, in. I can zoom see in the details. to well, see the details. Well, show us your painting. So um, this is my palette of red. And I have a lot of different reds from a very warm red uh, to some crimson colors to some very cool reds. And I'm always going back and forth and thinking warmer, cooler, warmer, right. cooler, lighter, darker in my colors. And that corresponds to your initial painting layer of the primary colors. I try to forget about what's underneath. Really? And let it do what it's going to do. And now I go back to my photo reference and I try to stay realistic to the warmer and cooler mm -hmm. and lighter, wow. darker of the flowers. And that underpainting will do its own thing. Right. Okay. So... Um, for this kind of painting, I like to use a, a synthetic uh, sable brush because I get a really great um, spring to it mm -hmm. and I get the pieces working exactly where I want it to. Um, on the edge of this flower, you can see that I ha actually have a shadow right in here. And uh, this is another reason I work on 300 pound paper because I can turn my paper in any direction I want to and it keeps my edge going exactly where I want it. Now I think I want something a little cooler um, dropped in here as well. Um, I had and a, this corresponds to the initial pencil drawing that's what you transferred. That's right. So you I, have these places marked out already of where you want this where shadow. Where I, I do want them, yes. And uh, you can see uh, when you start adding these little details in, you can start to see where the petals are curling towards you and creating a shadow rather than curling away from you. Beautiful. And well, that's you what have, makes it realistic. You have a piece that is very similar to this that's completed that you brought to show us. Let's take a look at that now. I do. This was my first painting I did of my trumpet vines. Um, and you can start to see, if you look for it, you can see the underpainting, you can see shadows of blue and yellow that float around mm -hmm. 
uh, between the background and the uh, flowers themselves. Um, I love doing the trumpet vines because they're in my backyard on this trellis so I can run out and really understand um, the uh, intricacies of the plants themselves by um, looking at them. Uh, they don't stay there the whole time for me uh, mm -hmm. because I paint so slowly and so detailed, so I do need to take photo references. Um, again, you can uh, see the swirl of blue and the yellow that comes through um, the uh, different petals. Yeah. Um, this was uh, some, based on some photos from a friend from Massachusetts who has <laughs> missed her lilacs. Um, the, this is uh, a memory for me from the Russian River. Um, the colors, by having that underpainting of blue and red and yellow, really makes the wrought iron come alive in the painting. Beautiful. And again, when you're doing things that are large and very detailed, it would be easy for it to um, look too much the same color. So uh, there are areas of blue and red and yellow that float through the, the blossoms in this one too. Oh, I see your underpainting. Beautiful. You can see it. In this case, this was taken in uh, a photo I took in my church. Uh, and I used the underpainting um, in order to uh, create the uh, different glow from the stained glass windows oh. that I reflected in the handbells. Very nice. Beautiful greens. Thanks. Uh, and it, it, this could be very monotonous if I didn't have um, all of those other colors underneath uh, to flow through the green. You can really see the translucent depth. It's beautiful. Thank you. You have such beautiful watercolors. Very briefly, tell us where we can see them in person. Oh, thank you. I exhibit my work at Gallery House on California Street in Palo Alto. Um, and so I always have something uh, there that you can see. Mm -hmm. I'm also doing street fairs now. Mm -hmm. And I am going to be at the Los Altos Fall Festival and the Oktoberfest Festival in Campbell in October this year. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for bringing your work and doing such a wonderful present presentation for us. That was fascinating. Thanks, your, Sally. Your art is beautiful. It was great to be here.